A very good evening and welcome to Capital Connection where we join the dots to give you the big picture for business in Africa. I'm Arnold Sagawa. On the agenda, Africa's film industry is a largely untapped source of employment and revenue. Some governments recognize the benefits of supporting the industry using tax breaks and uh, direct funding, while others view the sector in an almost frivolous light. Acclaimed South African producer uh, Anant Singh will give us his thoughts on the sector and our panel uh, will discuss uh, the state and direction of the continent's industry. And we also uh, get an update from uh, South Africa's uh, Judicial Commission of the inquiry into state capture. But first, Madagascar's crowded presidential elections last week uh, looked certain to go to a runoff vote on the 19th of December. The two contenders for the second and final round are likely to be drawn from either the current president, that's uh, President Eri uh, Rajao Nariman Pianina, or the former president, Sir uh, Andri uh, Rajaolina, or uh, Mark Ravola Manana. Now, South Africa's State Capture Commission, chaired by uh, Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, reconvened today with the former Minister of Public Enterprises, Barbara Hogan, expecting uh, to give a crucial testimony. CNBC Africa's correspondent, Karabu Tlatla, is at the hearings, and I got a chance to speak to him and asked him if uh, Hogan's appearance is uh, living up to the billing. Well, Adol, thank you very much. And keeping with that suspense theme, we are left on an edge of suspense as we speak by Barbara Hogan's testimony. Remember, Barbara Hogan was the Minister of Public Enterprise. That means numerous state-owned institutions really fell under her watch. And she was a Minister of Public Enterprise uh, from 2008 until 2009. And some might say therein lies the origin of what we call today a state capture. Barbara Hogan was really entailing how how systems might have been flouted, how the, 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 the dependency by some ministers and some members of cabinet to really cross-check and run everything with then-President Jacob Zuma might have led to this culture, if you will, of over-consultation, maybe by extension leading to the president to usurp some of his executive duties and do that that is the, the, the incumbent of, of the would-be minister. Barbara Hogan is expected to detail some of her experiences while she was there, particularly her in her interactions with the infamous Gupta family. She was minister around the time when the infamous Gupta family really wanted government to pull their lucrative route from Johannesburg to Mumbai and Mumbai back to Johannesburg in order of favoring jet airways. Now that is an Indian subsidiary that the Gupta uh, uh, family and friends had been used to using. In fact, an, an that same airline, Gupta, that same airline, Jet Airlines, hired the infamous uh, Boeing that ultimately landed at Waterclough Base uh, on, during the time of the infamous Gupta wedding. Barbara Hogan is really detailing her experience, but she did not fall short of even indicting her own party. She spoke about her affinity for the African National Congress, why she joined the African National Congress at a time when the black consciousness movement was the in form and flavor of the day in South African politics. That's after Steve Biko's passing. But of course, she also goes on to say that part of the problem with the ANC is that it, it doesn't even respect the same constitution that it has championed, if you will, that you hear randomly members of the National Working Committee, members of the NEC, members of the ANC in totality, really coming to terms to tell the minister who they think should be hired for what position within state-owned institution. And she says that was the beginning of the rot, if it were. I think we're a long way off from criminal charges, but we're slowly putting on the building blocks. The building blocks is to essentially have some sort of recommendations that the judge who is who is overseeing this, Deputy Chief Justice Zondo, will make recommendations not only to the president of the state, but also indict possibly some people and we are beginning to to see the building blocks of that at the beginning of this testimony today by barbara hogan she she really went into details with her lead attorney advocate mukwena to detail that her her testimony in particular will implicate former state president jacob zuma and that he's been given time to respond to that but as it has been with many other uh people who've taken the witness stand here the president has shown no appetite to 
to cross-examine Barbara Hogan, and maybe he doesn't feel that her testimony will be that implicating on his part as former state president. Now, Africa's film industry has yet to achieve its potential in becoming a serious contributor to the continent's fiscus. My colleague Chris Bishop spoke earlier with the renowned South African filmmaker Anand Singh about the state and financial promise of the industry. So just to start off with, uh, there's obviously a lot of talent, there's a lot of good storytellers in African film, but making bankable films is a lot more difficult. What can be done about this? We're, we're competing with um, Hollywood, which spends billions, hundreds of billions of dollars over the year um, with um, marketing, with production. And, it, you know, that in itself is a tough um, act to, uh, to try to beat. But I think what is the assets that we have are our own stories. And people actually do care about l watching movies that are different. And um, obviously, we will never be in that league to spend uh, a, a hundred million dollars um, on a film. And uh, we must use the, the strengths that we have. And as an example, I made a tiny little film called Yesterday, which was shot in KwaZulu-Natal. It was the first film ever to be made in uh, Isizulu. And it went on to become the first uh, Oscar-nominated film uh, from South Africa. And uh, it was about HIV and AIDS. And, uh, you know, obviously people told me, no, nobody's going to want to see this film. And I think we have to compete on the level of the stories that we can tell, that we can tell honestly. And people will embrace it because emotion and human um, connection is um, unbeatable. And I think that... Those are the strengths that we have on our continent, and we should just embrace it and do the best we can. Um, you know, we can come up with an action film. Nigeria does an amazing number of films um, uh, a year, and I'm sure something will come out of there that's going to um, capture the hearts and uh, uh, enthusiasm of audiences around the world. How much of a case do you think there is for Africa and South Africa in particular to do like a Australia or a New Zealand and come up with large tax breaks, visas, in the hope of um, stimulating tourism as well? Certainly the film industry has uh, enormous potential to do that. And in Africa, we've seen uh, pieces of it over the years. So about 20 years ago, Out of Africa was shot in Kenya. That bumped up tourism immensely. Uh, people saw this beautiful landscape, beautiful animals, and thought, wow, you know, we've never heard of this place. And, and they began to travel there. And likewise, I've had incidences when I went to the U.S. or to other countries with Cry the Beloved Country or Mandela more recently, and people embrace our continent and our stories. So I certainly feel that uh, this is something that we should be uh, pushing. And Clearly, the departments of arts and culture, uh, the tourism departments in government across the continent should work together on this. But I think one of the important things is we as Africans need to collaborate together and, um, and also grow our market indigenously, which is not something that's happening. I mean, I made a movie called Sarafina, and we couldn't even release it elsewhere in the continent. It was pirated everywhere. But, you know... Uh, I'm happy that everybody got to see it anyway. <laughs> and uh, th there is undoubtedly a sign that the industry has grown here. I mean, uh, I watch um, documentaries where the actors are here from South Africa. They've got the support of the Department of Trade and Industry in some cases. But how much further do you think the government could go here? Well, look, I think in South Africa, uh, we, we, there's always room for imp improvement. I think that when you look at the percentage of international films that actually come here to shoot versus the number of films that are local that are shooting uh, here um, the, and the spend, probably it's 10 or 20 times more uh, international film spends in, uh, on our, uh, country, in our country. Um, but I think government has recognized that the film industry has enormous potential um, and has continued to support it, which is a great thing. But I also feel that we need to uh, partner and do co-productions with 
our African um, uh, counterparts. And uh, and I think the industry, given technology um, and cell phones and all the mediums that we have, is going to continue to grow the industry. And um, two countries that submitted films for the first time to the Academy Awards were Nigeria, oh, sorry, um, uh, Malawi and Niger, which is great uh, for our continent uh, for the 2019 Academy Awards. And lastly, very briefly, uh, BRICS, South Africa's membership of the BRICS uh, block. Could that help the film industry here at all? I mean, I think BRICS um, represents the largest audience um, in the world, you know, and, and given the alliances. Uh, but I, I find that it's still a big challenge to try and get your movies released in the BRICS nations. Um, you know, the willingness was there. But uh, when you look at the box office in China, Brazil, India, uh, it's enormous. And uh, I think the, the, the mechanics of getting the films out there uh, is still lagging behind. But, um, you know, you take a, a Hollywood film uh, that opens in, in China today, it does more box office sometimes in that even in the United States. So a $100 million box office for an American film in China is almost uh, a weekly occurrence. So it's really got enormous potential. And I think the, the governments of each of those nations need to identify and continue to promote the uh, partnerships of BRICS, which I, it seems like they're doing it, but it's happening very slowly. Um, you know, I saw that there was a uh, BRICS film festival a few um, weeks ago. Um, which which was in, in the right direction, and there was an arts and culture uh, conference. So let's hope it uh, does materialize into something real. Now, in terms of uh, annual numbers of films made, Nigeria's film industry, aka Nollywood, is the world's second largest. But it does not make the top five when it comes to income. Can Africa's film industry be harnessed to ramp up employment and increase revenue? Coming up after the break. Welcome back. Now joining me to discuss the business of uh, the film industry on the continent in Kigali is uh, Eric Cabera, the director and co-founder of uh, the Kwetu Film Institute in Johannesburg, is the director of uh, the Rapid Lion International Film Festival. Eric Mieni, uh, joining me via uh, the phone from Cape Town is uh, Kate Pansagra, who is a producer and casting director of the controversial and very successful South African movie in Seba. Uh, many thanks for uh, making time to speak to us, the dear lady in Cape Town and uh, the gentleman. Let me start with you, Eric, uh, here in our studio. Um, uh, lots of challenges when it comes to uh, the industry as a whole. Uh, after one, I would say my biggest issue is the, the binge of uh, outside content as opposed to uh, us actually pushing our own content. Do you get the sense that this has, uh, is actually the biggest challenge? Yeah, it is by far the most uh, critical uh, 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 challenge in the South African film industry. So the new metros, the uh, stekinecos, even if they want to put the South African film on circuit for a long time, they can't because they have long-term contracts with United International Pictures, which they can't get out of. Uh, but they have an incredibly good model, which makes a hell of a lot of money. Mm. So it's a very difficult space, because it's a successful industry in a way, very successful, but it's not successful enough to push local content, if you like. Mm. That has its own challenges. So what everybody is looking at now is to uh, promote entrepreneurs who have good business plans to start a parallel circuit, uh, which doesn't have to compete with Stekinoko, which, for instance, can concentrate on African content, mm. local content, South African, not to say South Africa is not in Africa, but local content, which then has its own circuit uh, 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 that has its own audiences. And that is very, very possible. I know a few people who are working on that. I think Tomla Tandala, LK Theatres, and Dumangu are working on that model, and they've been at it for about nine years. So that's possible. But yes, it is definitely a big challenge right. uh, that we, we don't have a place 
to put our movies in in order to make our returns locally. Right. Uh, let me just uh, swing it over to Kigali and bring in the other Eric. Uh, Eric, watching Rwandan television over the years that I was actually there, same problem, without a doubt. Uh, do you get the sense that maybe more is being done on that end? I know funding might be an issue. How are you particularly addressing this? Can we really speak about the African film industry without the government's stake into it? I mean, we're not only competing on the African continent, but we're actually competing uh, at the global stage because, you know, you have so many films that are being produced by Hollywood, and you're talking about millions of dollars of, of budget. And then uh, if you go to a place like Cannes or, or AFM or all these international, you know, uh, exhibitions, Africa simply doesn't exist. And uh, for us to exist, actually, we need really serious muscle. It's not like the simple producer, Eric Abera, who's going to transform entirely uh, the whole industry of a, of a country or a few individuals on the continent to do it. I mean, we know that uh, it's not only confined to the Rwandan aspect of things. Uh, I think it's a cross board. You know, we see many African governments not really taking like uh, the role of cinema, the, the role of the media uh, we, we in, within it, all, all, the, all their own forms uh, right. to be taken seriously so that actually we can be visible, we can present our voices, our culture, our philosophy, our way of, of doing things. And uh, all African television networks are the same. I mean, what do you see is like uh, the Brazilian telenovelas and you know, the Mexican telenovelas or films that were made by Hollywood in the 80s and 90s, and, uh, or sometimes films that are pirated from DVDs and then they just put them on TV. I'm not necessarily saying about that on uh, Rwanda television, but across you know, the African continent, that's the reality. So for single producers, they just, you know, we keep on lamenting the, ourselves and we repeat the same thing, uh, we complain and we do the same thing. I mean, you know, it takes maybe you know, a couple million dollars to make a serious film. Uh, and if you talk about like Nigerian film industry, you know, you're talking about you know, ten thousands of dollars, uh, or where you know young producers go out there and just make films on on, on video cameras, and then they distribute them you know, them locally. I mean, they distribute a lot, but at the end of the day, I think a good framework is needed so that actually people can be skillfully trained, people can actually be exposed to the medium, and actually people can eventually take. Uh, the business seriously and take it to the world. Otherwise, you know, we'll just be repeating ourselves. I mean, it's going to be like, you know, over than 50 years since uh, the likes of the Samben started this struggle and uh, look at where we are. I mean, we have moved in a few inches, but I, I don't think that we are where, where we should be. We should be. I mean, you know, if you go other places, I mean, the competition is pretty high. Right, uh, Eric, uh, just allow me to put a pause on that. Let's uh, swing over to uh, Cape Town and bring Kate into the conversation. Now, Kate, uh, re uh, distribution is one issue that uh, Eric and Kigali has alluded to. But uh, another issue is uh, th many governments are actually uh, using uh, their apparatus and uh, sort of forums and commissions on uh, film to uh, curb anyone who might not agree with their uh, train of thought or uh, their agenda politically. Uh, just uh, give us a sense of what you actually uh, make of this particular premise. This is unfortunately something that we, as the filmmakers of Ingleba, of The Wound, experienced uh, very dramatically in that the film was essentially banned locally. It was pulled out of cinemas because it upset a lot of people. Um, but there were also there was also an enormous amount of support. There was an enormous appetite uh, from audiences who wanted to watch the film, who wanted to engage with it. And because it made a small faction of our society uncomfortable and it made a lot of high up people uncomfortable, um, people that, the people that we made the film for were prohibited from watching it uh, to the point where they felt unsafe to go to the cinema while the film was still in the cinema. Uh, so it's certainly an issue. And I think tied to this, our policy makers, our decision makers in government, um, you know, our South Africa is very fortunate to have both a national film fund and uh, a tax incentive system through the Department of Trade and Industry, which are instruments that other African countries don't have. But in our case, the the people in, in charge are not filmmakers. They don't understand what it takes to make a film. Uh, there's sometimes a sense of apathy about the amount of time, the amount of money, resources, and 
true resilience and tenacity that our industry demands for, um, demands of us to get films made, uh, particularly independent filmmakers and particularly filmmakers that have uh, something very and, uh, you know, something challenging that they want to interrogate through their work. So the personal investment required by the creatives is tremendous. Uh, so because of this, we found ourselves in situations where regulations and funding mandates uh, are not necessarily conducive or can even be obstructive to the creative process because the people right. managing them are not filmmakers. Uh, okay, fascinating indeed. Uh, Eric, I saw you nodding there. It's quite interesting what she says. Uh, the people in charge of some of these forums, uh, at least at the government end of things, ha are oblivious to the system, how, what it takes to actually make a film uh, or even stand behind the camera. Is this actu actually the biggest problem right now? No, actually it isn't. Uh, I think uh, uh, sometimes when a film gets banned, it gets a lot of uh, publicity. It makes even more money in other markets. So it's not always... Uh, a bad thing that happens. But we have, for instance, we are at Rapid Line, which is a South African International Film Festival. We support South African films. We get a lot of uh, our, our funding, if you like, from the government. But when we invited in Labour to come to the festival, they wanted $600. Maybe, uh, if, just if to, I could just... just uh, no, no, I'll get to it, but what I'm pointing out is we also don't know how to use each other's forums to push our own stuff because we're busy with the money side. Now, Nollywood hasn't got a government grant. Hollywood hasn't got a government grant. Yeah. I don't think Nollywood has a government grant. But South Africans, we have a government grant and we complain about it. We're actually in a very privileged position where we are not being an industry. Yeah. We are being a charity organization. It means we, we are not independent. We are dependent on the government and we don't make a cent out of our movies and we don't care if we don't make any cent out of movies and we say we're building an industry. So our thinking also has to change. Right. How do we get our movies to actually be profitable so we can make movies independent of the government. Now, this is where the first question is most important. We need an exhibition circuit and a distribution channel that allows us to get to our audiences yeah. so that we don't keep going back to government. So for me, it's not so much, I, I am thankful every time government give me one cent, whether they are late or not late, whether they understand or they don't, because it's a highly privileged position to be in. Right, uh, Eric, uh, maybe for some of our viewers who are oblivious to uh, uh, the, the moving clip, but uh, it was actually a, 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 a dubbed that it is pornography and uh, this actually went to court and uh, some players were saying that uh, it is not pornographic. Uh, very, very contentious issue there, but the reception was actually very good. Uh, let me take this uh, over to uh, Eric in Kigali. Eric, uh, we have seen some censorship across East Africa. I will not be naming any countries per se. Uh, how do you approach this? Is it better to actually be in the good books of the government or on the flip side? Well, just em embrace the private sector. I don't know what you think. Uh, I think it's a bit of both here. I mean, once we look at like the, the way how international cinema uh, exhibition or productions has been conceived, I mean, if you look at like Hollywood, you know, it's a heavy machine. I mean, you're talking about like, you know, like the fifth largest economy in the world, you know a few years back. And uh, if you look at it, I mean, it's a well-oiled machine. And you cannot really figure out how you actually can get your products exhibited, produced, produced and exhibited to an international level, even to like out on television networks. I mean, these are the discussions that other governments are trying to, you know, to embrace. I mean, like in Kigali now, you know, in Rwanda, we are, they're setting up, the government is setting up the Rwanda Film Office where you know, like these discussions will take place not only on the local level, but actually on the continental level, because we need to engage our government to get involved. We need to engage them to get them actually be informed about the industry and the role of the industry. Uh, I, I get the point of Eric saying, like, you know, we don't only have to sort of like rely fully on, on subsidies, but the support that is needed, it needs literally to be put on a launch pad. I mean, South Africa is a is a whole different case. I mean, if we talk about a film industry in Africa, South Africa may be uh, the only country on the, on the continent that has got actually a well-oiled machine that takes like some of the Hollywood productions and they also get, you know, their producers make films. Uh, in that sense, I think we need to bring various government institutions on board. The way how infrastructure, infrastructure is being given a priority, the way how education is being given a priority, I think media and cinema is actually a very strong tool literally to change people's minds on how they look at their lives, how they look at themselves, and how they need to be you know, projected out there.
Right, uh, Eric, we're actually running out of time, uh, uh, guys. Uh, let's just talk about this emphasis. Uh, I just want to take it to Kate in Cape Town. Uh, there's this uh, thought that uh, for a movie to be big across the continent, it has to uh, hit Cannes, uh, it has to be in uh, Europe, it has to hit some uh, film festival in Paris. Uh, uh, is this uh, something that we actually need to uh, ad address and uh, first embrace maybe Zanzibar and uh, Lagos and South Africa, Cape Town? Uh, let me first come to you, Kate, then I'll just uh, end it here with uh, Eric. I think that it's, I don't think that there's a one size fits all to any film. I think any any film that we make as producers has a very specific and clear strategy depending on <clears throat> a number of factors. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, but it really, it really comes down to what do we want this film to do and who do we want to see it. Um, and that that can change depending on on the film, but absolutely, I wish that I would really love to see more instruments for collaboration, for co-production, for distribution between African countries. This is something that is slowly but surely developing, and it's very exciting. But it does need to be taken seriously. We need some heavyweights behind us to to make this a possibility, and we need the government to understand how filmmaking works and to appreciate appreciate what it's capable of. I really uh, resonate right. with what Eric and Kigali is saying about the power of cinema. Without a doubt. Uh, Eric, you have the last word. Uh, in the end, it's not that governments mustn't support us, it's that we must know exactly how we need to be supported. If I talk for South Africa, there's no shortage of good filmmakers, no shortage of good uh, 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 films and so on and so forth, but we do need an outlet for these films so that our filmmakers don't end up relying on the government for every next film. I know filmmakers who've heard over 40 million rand and they haven't made a cent and they want more money. So what we need to do is so how do we need to be supported so that we get, end up being independent? And what Kate is saying is, in, is also important that we, we link up cross continentally so that the product travels across the continent. It hits here, goes around. As Rapid Line, we are saying, we are not accepted at Cannes. Okay, can we start our own film festival with a Cannes feel to celebrate our own filmmakers? And what that calls for is for our own filmmakers to also prioritize us and not prioritize Toronto, for example. Because mm. what also happens in South Africa is they make a movie, you are invite them, they say, no, we're not coming because we're going to Cannes. Because that's more important, that's more... And then we say we're building an industry, but we're not working together. So we, there's a lot of what we need to change ourselves and what we need to look at to be changed infrastructurally for us to, uh, to make a, 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 an impact. Without a doubt, the ever passionate Eric Miani there. That's where we'll leave it for uh, this edition of Capital Connection. Uh, thank you to my guests and uh, join us again on Monday and Wednesdays at uh, 6.30 Central African time. From me, have a good night.